And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples to pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the opportunity to hear your word tonight. We ask you, God, to let your spirit minister to each and every one of us. God, use us for your glory. Keep us in your hands. We love you and we worship you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Say hello to everybody watching us on Facebook. Elaine uh, uh, commented last time. So hello, Sister Elaine from Arizona. And hope you're uh, listening in. And just glad that uh, all of you that are listening in on Facebook are there. I want to um, carry on the, the lesson that we talked about last Thursday um, on Teach Us to Pray. And so this would be part two of Teach Us to Pray. Um, so last week I taught on this subject. This is, uh, this is an area that God wants to develop in our church. It, it, prayer is something God is, is seeking to help us grow in as a church. Um, God has told us several times that it is his desire to take us to a higher plane, to a higher level, that we grow and become mature and have stronger, uh, uh, more strength, more ability in us. And the foundation of everything that we will do in our Christian walk is going to be based off of our prayer life. Your prayer life is a foundational area in your walk with Jesus. And so to go up higher or to go up further, the prayer needs to accompany that, that as well. It needs to go up as well. And so we studied, we studied last week about the importance of prayer. How that God made us incapable to do certain things and, and, and in a, unable to take care of the, the needs that are in our life. And because of that, he, he gave us prayer. We are to go to God in prayer because that is his plan for us in our life, that we would come to him in that prayer. He, God asks us or desires for us to ask him, to come to him and ask him for those things that we have need. He, he also has said that he knows our needs even before we even ask him. And so we are never going to God with something that is going to surprise him. We are never going to God with something that he's unaware of. There's nothing that is hidden from him. And he knows us and he knows our, our, well, our lives very well. And, and we're not troubling God when we come to him in prayer. If we come to him with needs in our life, we are not troubling God. It is his desire. And so we talked about the methods of prayer. And we looked at Matthew 6, uh, 5 through 13, when Jesus taught about how to pray. He gave us the prayer map. We discussed a portion of that. Our approach in prayer, or our posture in prayer is in repentance. That is our posture. When you begin prayer, it's not with a spirit of pride or a spirit of arrogance, but we come to God with a posture or a spirit of repentance. We, we come to Him in that approach and, and humbling ourselves and praying not for man's approval, but to reach the throne of God. We begin our prayer in, in that prayer roadmap with, uh, with worship, telling God of our love, of our devotion, of our adoration to Him. We worship Him. We let Him know that He is more important to us than anything else in our life. And, and it, it, let me just say this. It's not just saying words to God. 
It's not just speaking words out of our mouth, but it's a heartfelt thanksgiving to God. I, I get up in the mornings when I go to work and, and, and I, I, I don't say that I follow the map perfectly. I, I'm not saying that, but what I say is I, I approach God each morning with that, that very thing that God, I thank you for the life that you've given me and I thank you for the things that you have blessed me with, God. I, I know, God, that it is your hand that has given me everything that is in my life and without you, I don't even have the breath to breathe. I, I come to God with, with, a, with a humble attitude and letting him know of, of my love and my thanksgiving to him. And so that's, that's the beginning of the approach of, of, of our absolute need for God. And so we begin with that prayer. Next, we seek his absolute will in, in our life. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We place our sides aside, or our wills aside, and we seek what God desires. We're asking God that whatever it is in his kingdom that he wants to happen in our life, in the life of the people that are in our, 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 our church, our city, our midst, our, our family, we're, we're asking for his kingdom, his will, what he desires to be manifest. We have to understand that whatever God wills and whatever God desires is always the best. Many times we're afraid to ask God to do his will and not ours because we think that God's will is worse than ours. In our mind, we, we put the two levels together and we weigh them on the scale and we say, if I were to weigh my will and God's will, my will would always outweigh God's will because it's better than God's will. God's will is to take things from me. God's will is to give me suffering instead of pleasure. God's will is all of these things that we, we, we think when we ask for God's will, but that is not true. That's right. God's will is always so much better than ours. And so when we understand that and when we really realize that God's will is far superior to ours, then we will understand that praying his will is the very best in every way. And so we, we, we go to him seeking his will and his kingdom. And then we go into the process of give us this day our daily bread. We're asking God. We're seeking intervention in our situation. We're asking for the needs and the desires of our heart. And this is where we stopped last week. We, we got to this point and we stopped to, to this last week. Um, understanding that our asking is so that God may perform the requests that we have. Asking in faith that God can do the very things that we, we desire of him. But always understanding that, it, that God's will is supreme, not ours. That's right. Amen. If the answer is no, no yes. we accept that answer. Yes. If the answer is no, then thy will be done. Yes. But God desires for us to ask. And so, I want to continue the rest of this roadmap and then discuss some more of the, of the teachings of Jesus on prayer. I want to know what Jesus has to say about prayer. So Matthew 6, 12 through 13, is the remainder of that portion of prayer. It says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's the last portion that Jesus taught to the disciples about how to pray. So after we petition God for the things that we desire, we ask him to forgive us our debts. Now, wouldn't that be amazing if that meant, God, please pay off my bills. Forgive me my bills, forgive my home loan, forgive my auto loan, forgive my... Wouldn't that be wonderful? No, because then that would make us selfish and self-serving and we would just go out and get more loans for next week so that we could ask God to forgive us our debts. But debts, debts, debts. Um, that's, that's the thing, the word 
that Jesus uses here. And so it's interesting that Jesus uses the term debt here and not sin. And forgive us our sins as we forget our, those that sin against us. It's interesting that he uses that term. I looked it up um, to make sure that it meant debt and not sin. And when I looked it up, it does in fact mean debt. Debt. Debt is something that is owed to someone else. So in this context, Jesus takes sin because we know that that is the essence of what he is talking about. He's not talking about monetary value. He's talking about something that is owed to someone else. And so he's, he's, he, he is equating sin to a debt. And he's saying that every sin that we commit is a sin against God. It's a sin against God. Whether, whether you think you're stealing something from the grocery store, whether you think that you're, you're lying to your boss, whether you think that you're doing something that is getting it over on another person, God says, no, the debt is not to that person. The debt is to me. You, you have to understand, God, God, God is saying here that when you sin, you are creating a debt or you are, you are counting up your wrongdoing in a debt to me. Your sin is growing in my bank account of the things that you have done wrong. And, and that's what God is saying. It, it adds up or it creates a debt. Now, there was a parable that Jesus taught about two who owed their master money. And he talked about how that one had a great amount of money that was owed and the other one had a little bit of the money that was owed. And then the master brought them both in and neither one of them had the ability to pay. One of them owed a bunch, had, didn't have enough to pay. That one that owed a little didn't have enough to pay. So he forgave them both their debts. And they went away. And then he asked the question, who do you think was more thankful? And they said, well, obviously the one that had the greater debt. Understand that that whole subject that Jesus was talking about was because Jesus looked at somebody and said, thy sins be forgiven thee. It was all about the forgiveness of sin. And Jesus took that time to teach a parable about a debt that was owed or sin that was accounted unto somebody. And so we have to understand that sin is accounted unto us. The things that we do are accounted unto us. And so Jesus takes this time in this prayer to teach us to ask God to forgive us of our debts. Of, of what we owe. It's a debt. We cannot pay that debt. The reason we have to ask that that debt be forgiven is because there is nothing that you can do. There is no amount of money that you can give. I, nobody can sell you an indulgence. Nobody can ask you to go to the priest and, and, and confess and then be forgiven. No man and no thing and nothing that you can do can ever erase that debt. Yes. I understand and I, I, I teach and I believe that the blood of Jesus covers our sins. But when we walk through this life, we do make mistakes. We do fail. We do do things that we should not do. They are accounted. And, and the Bible teaches us if we have failed and we have made mistakes, if we will confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us or to cancel those sins. So you have to understand that Jesus is teaching the apostles how to pray. Okay? So it's not just one time that I'm forgiven of my sins and I never need to repent of them again. He's teaching the apostles this, how that they should pray. And he's telling the apostles, when you make a mistake, when you do something wrong, when you deny me three times, you do whatever it is. Then I'm telling you that you need to say, you need to ask me to forgive you of your debts, of your sins. And so he's very, very clear. He's very, very clear about seeking forgiveness from God that our debts could be erased. 
And understand this, that when you ask God, when you ask God to forgive you of your sins, He forgives you of your sins. It's not something that you have to beg God for because the devil will stand on his shoulder and he will try to bring up all of your past wrongs and all the things that you've done and all the failures that you've made in your life and he will try to beat you over the head with that. But the devil doesn't have the right to be your accuser because we have an advocate that says his debt is canceled. He asked me to forgive him. I saw the repentance that was in his life and on his heart and I have forgiven him. And so... Understand that when you do ask God to forgive you, you are forgiven. Unless the second part is not done. In the same prayer, there is a responsibility that is given. And it says, forgive us our debts. How? As, as is, is the conjunction there. It ties those two thoughts together. And it says that I want this done as this is done. Okay? So this is what I want to have done. But the way that I want this done is the way that this is done. You got it? I want a picture and I want it drawn just like this picture is drawn. And Jesus says, forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors. So that's the teaching that Jesus gives us. And so he says, I I want you to come to me and I want you to forgive or ask me for forgiveness. But what you need to understand is that the forgiveness that you're going to ask of me and the forgiveness that you're going to receive from me is going to be proportional to the forgiveness that you give to other people. It's going to be proportional to the forgiveness that you give to other people. How you forgive is tied, or how you're forgiven is tied to how you forgive others. We go before the throne of God with every offense. And there at the throne of God, we let go of the offenses that have come against us. We forgive as we are forgiven. What I want God to do in my life, I'm willing to do for others. I'm willing to do. We are not allowed to hold on to the grudges and the hurts of our past. We cannot keep them in our back pockets. We cannot carry around rocks in our hands and say, we have a right to throw our rock. We have a right to judge someone else. We have a right to say this or do that because that person did this to me. Because they said this or did this. We we have no right to do that. We have to forgive. We have to forgive. Uh, Am I I misinterpreting? It's very clear. Forgive me my sins as I forgive those that have debt to me. If we do not forgive, then we cannot be forgiven ourselves. Forgive us as we forgive others. We are telling God that at the level I forgive, then please forgive me. That's a very powerful understanding of prayer. To realize that at what level we release the hurt and the hate and the pain that others have done to us is what we are asking God to, at that level, forgive us. Do you realize how miraculous forgiveness is? I mean, do you really understand how miraculous forgiveness is? Has anybody ever hurt you, Crystal? Oh, yeah. Any, anybody ever hurt you, um, Sister Juanita? Yep. Anybody ever done anything to you, Scott? I mean, were you, you, you had a legitimate right to hold a grudge? Jonathan? L- let me just ask this. Anybody who has not had anybody do something to you that you have a legitimate right to hold a grudge, raise your hand. 
So that's all of us. So every one of us has gone through life. Welcome to life. And somebody's offended you, hurt you, done something. And you had a legitimate, it was a real deal. You had a legitimate right. It's not something that you contrived. It's not something that you made up. This is a real thing. And you have a right. Do you understand how, how, what a miracle it is for, for you to be able to let that go? What a miracle it is that God would come into your life, touch your heart, and, and take that thing that was in your hand and then just kind of pry it open and then take it out. It's not that God steals it from you, but He helps you to open your hand. He helps, helps you to, to let go. And then you... Give that up to Him. That is a miracle beyond any understanding that I will ever understand. And there, there have been people that have had the most, most painful things done in their life. And they carried those things around for the longest period of time. And it ate them. And it destroyed them until the point that they were able to say, I can't do this anymore. And God, you've got to help me. And when they turned to God and they allowed God into that secret place of where that thing resided and God began to begin to work on that, begin to deal with that, and begin to open that up. And then they were finally able to release it. There was no way they could do that on their own. There was no way that they had the ability or the power to let go of the offense. But because they allowed God into that place, because you have to understand, those are places that we guard very tightly, and we hold them, and we don't even let the presence of God into those areas. But when we do, when, we, when we're tired, Tired of it, and, and we realize that I can't be forgiven until I forgive them. Yes. And we're able to release that. Mm -hmm. Then there is such a freedom that comes into that person's life. Such a liberty. Has God liberated you from that before? Has God liberated you from those things? He has liberated me. He, 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 has, he has dug junk out of me. He has, he has done things in my life. And, and there's more that I find in my own self and in my own walk that God is constantly dealing with me about. But that is one thing that is a lesson that we have to understand. That it's God forgive me as I have forgiven others. And so whatever happens in your life, I don't know what the future holds for any person in this church. But I can tell you this, that offense will come. And you will have things that will come into your life and you will have issues that will come to try you and you will go through and you will suffer. It, that's just life. I'm sorry. Jesus does not take us out of those things, but he lets us know that offense will come. And so you have to, you have to keep that on, on the altar. That's why it's in prayer. It's putting it on the altar and saying, forgive me. For my sins as, as I forgive others. And so it, it's such a powerful prayer. This whole prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples. I, I'm not even doing it justice. But what, what an amazing thing that, that God taught to us and gave to us and showed to us. The truths that are there in prayer. And then he goes on he says, and lead us not into temptation. We ask God. It, it, it's not that God would take you by the hand and say, okay, now I want to bring you over here to this place where I know you're weak and I'm going to do everything I can to get you to fall. Right, no. That's not what that is, okay? Because the Bible says that God tempts no man. But what it's talking about is that God establish my steps. 
Help me to walk so that I do not fall into temptation. God, be the voice in my heart and in my life. Be the conviction to me, God. When, when, I, am, when I am near the lines and I am, I am beginning to stray, God, let your voice speak to me. Let the Holy Ghost convict me, God. Help me, God, to walk in the pathways that are right, that are holy, that, that, that are just before you. You see, if, if we let ourselves go the way that we want to go, if we give ourselves over to our own desires and we're going to lead ourselves astray but what we're asking in prayer is today God this day God help me because there's going to things going to be things that are going to come up in my life that are going to tempt me that are going to try to lead me astray they may not be be a, 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 a sin that is just as blatant as ever but it could be something that just begins to draw me down a pathway that I should not go Just some small little thing that will try to distract me or cause me to do something that I shouldn't do later on in my walk. But Lord, lead me, lead me not into temptation. Keep me. God, I I desire to walk in holiness and I want to be pleasing to you. So God, let your spirit speak to me today. Let your spirit guide me through this day. Let your direction, God, be my every step be guided by you, God. And then he says, and and deliver us from evil. This is not sin as an evil or doing something wrong. um, But this is trouble in life. We're asking God to keep us from the perils of life. Deliver me from trouble today. Keep my family safe. Watch over me, God. Wherever we go, we, we go fishing, Scott. What's the first thing we do before we ever pull out of that yard? We pray in that truck. We pray God's protection. We pray God's direction. We pray God's covering on us the whole way down there. We pray for the biggest fish that we can possibly catch. And then we pray for a safe trip home. Hey, if you're going to ask, ask big. But deliver us from evil. We're asking God to keep us from the perils of life. God... Set a watch around my family and a watch over our church and keep away the troubles of this world. God desires us to ask for his protection from the issues of life. I can say that this has been a, a great area where God has intervened in my life. I, I have not had issues in my life that others have had because of the hand of God. And it's not just, um, it's not just a, a tree falling on me when I walk through the woods. It, it, it's keep me from the perils of life. Keep me from trouble in my marriage and issues in my family. Keep me from having these things that come in and, 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 and cause trouble in, in my life. Keep, God, keep watch over our church that, that there's no offense, no trouble in our church. This, this, is, this is my life. It really is. Every day I get up, I pray over our church. And, and so we, we, we have to pray and ask God. That his covering, his hand, his grace, his mercy would be over the different areas and different issues in our life. Keep our children from being influenced by the kids that are out there that are evil influenced. Keep keep my, my husband, my wife from being seduced by the things that are around them and keep, uh, keep my eyes from seeing things that they should not see. Keep my ears from hearing things that they should not hear. I mean, these are real serious yes. Things. I I work in an office and 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 I work around a lot of different people, women included. I I don't want anything at all coming to be at any way a temptation to me. You you work in different areas in different places and you're around different people. We we, we got to set a guard around us. We have to pray for those things. And so this was. Um, The teaching of Jesus to the disciples on prayer. Prayer comes from the heart. As I said earlier, it's not from the lips. We pray because we mean what we say. It's not a prayer of recital. It's not a prayer of going through a period of just saying, God, cover this and do that. And there there is a prayer that comes from the heart. It's It's an honest prayer to God. 
it, it, it's, it, it's an honest prayer of love and devotion to Him. We end this prayer with the way that we began this prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We, we, we come in the close of this prayer in worship to God. We have petitioned God. We have, we have sought the direction, the correction, the understanding, the things of God. But now we come to God in closing and we worship Him again. It's an honest worship. And so when we come to Him, we, we are coming to God in this fashion. It's an example for us to follow in prayer. But this is not the only teaching that Jesus had concerning prayer. We read of several other instances where Jesus taught the people about praying, about the importance of prayer and how to pray. Luke 11, 8 and Luke 18, 1. Now these are two separate places, but they're teaching the exact same thing. So if Jesus is going to teach something twice, he's telling you that it's important. I want you to get this. So I'm not going to just teach you once about this, but I'm going to bring this up at a later time. I want you to understand the importance of this. He says in Luke 11, 8, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And then in Luke uh, 18, 1, and he spake, a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray you should always pray and not faint now Luke 11 8 is the continuation of the teaching to the disciples about prayer he has taught them the roadmap to prayer but then he goes on to another portion of this and he teaches them about being constant in prayer Jesus is specifically instructing the listeners to be constant or consistent in their persistent prayer. Yes. So there are two parables and they're about the same issue. In one parable, the, when, when he teaches the roadmap of, of, of prayer, he goes on to teach about being persistent in prayer. And, and, he, and he talks about a man that was in bed and asleep. And he had a friend come to his house and knocked on the door. And so he, 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 he hears the man uh, uh, knocking on the door. And the man that is knocking on the door is asking him for bread because that man has had somebody come to his house. Now they're friends. They're they're. They're me and Jonathan, they're me and Scott, they're me and Brandon, me and, me and uh, uh, what's your name again? <laughs> Mitchell. My brain, I do that all the time. It, it, it's, it's a friend. They, they, the friend comes. Now, we, we'll do anything for a friend, Brother Aaron. We'll, we'll help a friend out at any time. But this is, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in bed. My kids are in bed. We're asleep. And the guy's knocking on the door. And he's like, will you give me some bread? He's like, would you go home? I'm in bed. I'm asleep. But you're my friend and I need bread. You can get the bread in the morning. We're in bed. We're asleep. And Jesus says that the guy gets out of bed, gets the bread and goes and gives him the bread. Not because he's his friend has nothing to do with the fact that you're my son-in-law. It has to do with the fact that you won't keep your finger off the doorbell. And I'm not getting any sleep as long as you keep ringing that stupid doorbell. So here, here's the bread. Now leave me alone. What got him out of bed was the constant knocking on the door. And so then Jesus goes on and he, and he teaches another parable, the second parable. Um, he said that we should pray and not grow weary. <clears throat> and, and so in this, there is a woman and she has to go before a judge 
over a wrong that was done to her. Now, Jesus says that this is an unjust judge. He does not fear God and he does not fear men. And so he's, he's, he's an unjust judge. So the woman goes before the unjust judge and she tries to get her case resolved. But the unjust judge will not do anything for her. And so the next day in court, the woman appears again. And the unjust judge says, I told you yesterday, I heard your arguments. They haven't changed. Forget it. I'm not dealing with it. And day after day after day after day, this woman keeps coming in and will not leave him alone. Uh -huh. She is determined that she's going to get justice in her issue. And the judge says to himself, I don't fear God. I don't account for men. But because this woman won't leave me alone, I'm going to give her what she's asking for. And so the parable that Jesus taught was specifically about, about understanding that in your prayer, persistence in prayer, importunity or persistence in prayer, not giving up. Keep your finger on the doorbell. Ring that thing as much as you can. Keep, keep knocking on the door. Keep bringing the case and the cause before the throne of God. Because why? Because Jesus is teaching this. It's not man teaching this. This was not Peter. This was not anybody else. Jesus is teaching a about prayer he just told the apostles he just told them how to pray now he's telling them what you need to do in your prayer is to be persistent 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 before the throne of God you, you've got to keep it there and any and, he, and then he taught all of the people this about the woman he, he, he wants he wants us to be persistent. There, there are two parables, but they're the same thing. Persistency with God pays off. According to the parable and the teaching of Jesus, persistence in prayer moves the hand of God. That's powerful. Persistency in prayer moves the hand of God. Look at the parable. Neither person was going to get what they wanted. Neither one of them were going to get it. The woman was not going to get her judgment and the man was not going to get the bread. The judge and the man were not going to do what was asked of them because, because they were not going to do it because they wanted to. They, they didn't just come to the realization that he's my friend, I need to give him bread. She's been unjustly done, so I need to help her. Right. It didn't have anything to do that. No. The judge heard the case and he wasn't going to do anything. And the man knew that that was his neighbor and his friend, but he wasn't about to get out of bed. What moved both of them was the persistency of the request. The woman would not stop coming before the judge and the man wouldn't stop knocking on the door. Luke eleven eight, And I say unto you, though he will not rise to give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as he needeth. Luke 18, 5. Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Be persistent in your prayers. Keep the need before the throne of God and ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Keep your request before the throne of God. And I know this sounds reverse to what I said last week, that we are to seek the will of God and not ours. And that, that, that by persistency, we are seeking our will. I, I, I know I said that um, in, in a manner. But what we have to see is that some things are meant to be kept persistent and some things are not. Okay, there are some things that are kept are, are, are meant to be kept persistent before the throne of God and some things are not. And so 
when you're in persistent prayer before the throne of God, and God says to you, no, knock it off. That means, no, knock it off. I have, I've had that. I have felt God say, look, that's not going to happen. Just understand it, accept it, and go on. When God gives you that answer, when God speaks to you in that manner, we need to obey that. It's not time to keep ringing the doorbell. Because then you're going to get the judgment of God. You are in disobedience then because God has, has told you to stop. He's told you to stop. God will let you know when to stop. Jeremiah 14, 11. We know who Jeremiah is. We know what Jeremiah did. He prayed and asked God for the nation of Israel. But then in Jeremiah 14, 11, it says, Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people, for their good. Stop. Quit. It's done. I, I have made up my mind that I am going to judge them. And, and you can cry all you want. You can let your tears flow. You can do whatever you want. But these people are bound. And I am sending them into judgment. And so God said, stop, Jeremiah. Don't pray for these people. Paul petitioned God constantly. We don't know how long, but we know he said, I asked God to take this infirmity from me. What did God say? No. No, that one's staying with you. I I'm leaving that right there. There's a reason I'm leaving that right there. Is because if I take that away from you, your pride will grow. So I I'm going to leave it right there. And so Paul said, I've asked God. I've petitioned God. I kept my finger on the doorbell until I got an answer from God. And the answer from God was, get your finger off the doorbell and I'm not taking care of the need. I'm not doing that. I have determined that this is what I want done and I'm not changing my will. And then Paul said, then I will rejoice. I will thank God for what he's given me in, in this infirmity in my flesh. I will rejoice in my infirmity. I, I, I will take this as a blessing from God. Yes. And so, importunity in prayer or consistency or, or, or being persistent in a prayer is very important. It's biblical. But when we get the answer, and if the answer is no, stop, then just stop. Stop. God will let you know. You'll feel the conviction in your heart. You will. James spoke about prayer. Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer, James 5, 16, of a righteous man does what? It availeth much. James said that prayers are to be effectual and fervent. The word here for fervent is energio. I think I said that right. It is to be operative, be at work, put forth power. Fervent prayer is, is energy. It's where we get our word energy from. When you pray, pray with energy. The effectual fervent, the, the, the effectual prayer with energy is very effective. Put your heart and soul in to pray. When you pray, pray with, with passion. Pray in the Spirit. Yes. Let, let, let prayer be something that is full of energy. Not, not pious. Not, it's not meant to... It's, it's, supposed to, it's supposed to have energy in it. It's supposed to have power in it. When you do that, it is extremely effective. The power of a prayer, according to James, is very effectual. It's effective. What is it effective at? If it's effective, 
the effectual, the, the, the prayer that has a lot of energy, the heart and the spirit behind it, the, the, the prayer that is full of the passion of the person, not just off the top of my head, not just speaking random words, not just saying a prayer, but something that I have engaged my heart, my spirit, my soul in, and I am praying an earnest prayer before God. You know what I'm talking. When, when you're in prayer and, 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 and we bow our head before uh, uh, our, our meal and we pray Lord bless this food and there there's a difference between that and when we're in a serious need and we have really gone before the throne of God and we have put our heart into this God God is speaking through James and he's saying when you when you are effectual and you are fervent when when you're putting yourself into that it's very effective it availeth much it's very effective what does it affect? If it's effective, what is it affecting? Anybody want to venture, I guess? God. You're, you're affecting God. You're reaching the ear of God. You're getting the attention of God. You, you're making God stop. Stop and look and say, that is, is really coming into my throne with power, with force. That's really affecting. Mm -hmm. it, it's affecting things. It, it, uh, it, it, it affects God. We, we could say it affects hell. We could say it affects all those things. But you've got to understand your prayer can do nothing on its own. What it does is ask God to release something for you that will affect the kingdom of hell. When you are praying and your prayer is effectual and fervent, it is affecting God. It's affecting him. Don't believe me? Well, there's this guy that's mentioned in the Bible. Really nice guy. He's a good guy. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he gave. And he gave and he gave and he gave. And God said, his prayers and his alms did what? Came up before me as a memorial. This dude prays and this dude gives. And in his prayer and in his giving, it has affected me. It has, it has affected me. So I want to do something for him. Yes, yes. I, 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 his, his prayers and his alms have come up before me as a memorial. Now there's a lot of people praying. There's a lot of people giving. But God said, I can, I can see everybody's praying and I can see everybody's giving. But there's something about this effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. It has affected me. Yes. And so I want to do something for him. So, what does God do? It affected God and God dispatched an angel. And the angel went to Cornelius and said, I want you to send for Peter. It affected God so much that God dispatched the same angel to go to Peter. And tell Peter, hey, there's going to be three men that are going to come here. Don't worry about anything. You just listen to what I'm going to tell you to do. Yeah. Don't question anything. Yes. Follow them. Right. Yes. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Yes. When you pray, it affects God. Yes. Yes. It affects him. It, 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 it gets his attention. It does. It, it gets his attention. It's not a coincidence that God has been speaking to us on these two things that I just spoke about, about Cornelius, giving and praying. God spoke to us about giving, that giving is going to unlock things in our lives, in our church, in our city that have not been unlocked before. God spoke to us about that before Brother Hernandez ever got here. There's a power in giving. There is a great power in giving. 
and, and, and I need to bring this up to us again, to, to, to say again that, that we need to give what we can give to the kingdom of God financially. I understand your time. I understand your energy. I understand all of that. But God is asking for us to give of our finances to his kingdom. You know, we, we put a box back there, a second box. It's, it's to the left of the tithe box. And it's for our, our church, buy a church fund. We, we want to, whether it's this building or another building, we want to buy our own, have our own building. We don't want to rent anymore. And so we have a five-year goal. We're going to give to that five-year goal. We're, we're going to give financially. My wife and I are giving financially to that. People in this church are giving financially to that. We need to give. We, we have to. I'm not asking for your money. I don't need your money. I'm not taking it. But we need to give because we need to, we, we need to obey what God is desiring us to do. And he says that we need to give in our tithe and our offering. We need to do that. We, we've got to do that. And so we give in that, but then we pray as well. And these are the things that God is giving us for opening up things in, in growing in our relationship with him growing to that next level and opening up things in our city, in our lives, and in our families. It's so important for us. God is opening up new avenues of, of praying. We are going out on the front lawn on Monday nights and we're praying. Monday nights at 7 o'clock. We're going to be right out there on that front lawn praying for 20 minutes. And then we're going to come in here and have our Bible study. That, that is a, a place that we've never gone before. Well, we did it last Saturday. But, but on a consistent basis, this is, this is entering into a different level than we've ever been in before. It really is. It's more than just being out there with your face in the grass and praying. It's way more than that. I can tell you spiritually what is what has transpired and how I have physically and spiritually been under such um, such oppression, trying to do everything to stop us from doing that. But that's what we're doing, and it is it is opening things up like we can't even imagine. We're we are. We're walking into spiritual warfare like we've never walked into spiritual warfare before. And I'm just telling you that straight up. We're walking into a level of spiritual warfare that this church has never engaged in before. But we've been prepared for this. Sister Mary Irene, we have been prepared to do this. We have learned how to stay together. God, what did God speak to us in the beginning of this year? What was the theme? Unity. Unity. Why? Because he was going to lead us right here. To the place that we would engage in a manner that we've never engaged in before. And it's going to take unity. Because the devil will do everything he can to tear us apart. To divide us and bring offense. But this is a level. It's, it's greater than anything that we've ever engaged in before. It's doing more impact to this city than anything that we've ever done before. More impact than, than praying against Piwackets. More impact than anything else. This is doing that. And so we have to understand that God is trying to teach us, trying to help us to get to that place where we are more effective in everything that we're doing. In prayer, in giving, whatever God asks us to do. That's what we're going to do. Can we stand tonight? I know this has been more teaching than preaching. <clears throat> but God is trying to lead us to grow, to mature, to become more, more powerful, and to become stronger in our spiritual walk, which 
a basis of that is prayer. What, what we do, if we're, if we're ever going to get anywhere, it's going to be by prayer. If we're going to accomplish anything, it's not going to be through preaching. It's not going to be through singing. It's not going to be through game nights and good food. If we're going to accomplish anything in this city, it's going to be by prayer. So God is trying to help us to understand how we should pray, with what earnestness we should pray, and how persistently we need to be in that prayer. I, I will not stop in teaching and preaching on this subject. It, it will come up more and more as we progress because this is something that if we're going to accomplish what God wants us to do, then it's going to be by this. I'm going to teach on giving. That's a very uncomfortable thing. It's very uncomfortable. You know how I know it's uncomfortable? Because when I start preaching on it, I can feel it. Sorry. That's just the spirit that we have to fight against. Once we break that, once we get into the liberty of giving, just giving in liberty, we're going to see stuff that we ain't never seen before. Because God is leading this church. God is directing this church. Could we come and could we pray? Could we just seek the face of God for a moment in closing tonight? Amen.